morning. So uh, this time we're doing counting. Last time we did hardware. Uh, and if I get my mouse to the slide, I might... C'est bon? Ah. Now if I can get here. There we go. This is the recipe from last year. And last year uh, we uh, hit the right button rather than the wrong one that time. Last year we did the first two lines in blue. And we're going to do a little bit of the green line this year. So we're going to get a little bit farther in this overall recipe this year. And for those who prefer English units, uh, there you are. Now, uh, we're this. Um, excuse me. We're going to do a bit of a review, a fast review of those things. I'm not going to try to take it slowly and pound through it. Uh, if if it uh, is confusing or problematic, I encourage you to view last year's. Uh, but of course, ask questions at any time because it's more important to have a discussion than it is for me to get through a set pile of slides. Okay, uh, distribution. And uh, merci Anne pour le bon mot. And we're going to uh, hand these out. Uh, and the reason for handing them out is because we need to learn at the end of this whether you've, whether you've actually learned something from the presentation, all right? Um, you can eat them if you want to. That might contribute to the error in the uh, evaluation. You could, of course, keep the wrapper and do it that way, but I'll leave that to your judgment. Anyway, these guys are going to pass them out. I'll continue while they're doing that because this is going to be review more or less. So what laws of physics? I wouldn't have believed this when I was a kid, but the fact is for computation day, atoms are just too freaking big. I mean, they're inconveniently big. And the problem is that if you have a transistor, uh, the smallest, skinniest base you can get, with a few research exceptions, is one atom. And the thickness of the base, the thinner the base, the faster transistor goes. And we really have atoms that don't have very many atoms thick on the base. So we're kind of stuck with that. So um, that's a problem we have. Another problem we have is light is too slow. Uh, my employer's computers, the most common type, is about this big. All right. And in one clock cycle, an electric wave through silicon goes about that far. And as you can see, you're not going to make it across that whole complex in one cycle. It's going to take a lot of cycles. Uh, furthermore, there's a bunch of other things on top of just moving the data that cost. A protocol overhead, electronics, multiplexing and demultiplexing, clock domain transitions. So last I knew, that was three periods of the slowest clock to get from one clock transit domain to the other unless they were integral multiples which they never are because we have thermal throttling and changing of clock frequency. And then uh, the actual memory itself has to change. So we've got, we're up against some pretty nasty laws of physics. Uh, and uh, the part in red down there, I guess, is the important part. Uh, I actually heard Gordon Moore of Moore's Law say this with my own ears. Uh, he said that uh, they brought Stephen Hawking out to Intel Research to kind of look at what they were doing and see what they could do to help with the basic fundamental laws to make things go faster. And uh, Gordon Moore says that Stephen Hawking said the following, gentlemen, you have two fundamental problems. One, the finite speed of light, and two, the atomic nature of matter. And uh, well, uh, one of you guys may be able to make something go faster in light and somehow make atoms is smaller, and if you do, there's probably a Nobel Prize waiting for you, and that'll be really cool. I'd like to see it. In the meantime, in the meantime, uh, we have to deal with the world we have and the laws of physics we, we know of at this point. And, and by the way, this is all empirical, right? It's not like the speed of light is mathematically set. It's just that we measured it, and, you know, who knows, right? Uh, likewise with atoms, they've always been the same size, uh, give or take, in different compounds and things like that. But the key point is the hardware architects are all well aware of these limitations. And uh, what they've done, this is an old system. Uh, this is a, an Intel Core 2, which is from many years back. The reason I'm using that is because you can kind of see it on the slide. If I were to use a modern one, uh, you wouldn't be able to see anything because it'd be too, too small of everything. But the key point is here, and I'm not going to go through this in detail, but if you look at the stuff coming down the left and the stuff on the top over there, there's, you can have well over 100 instructions in the process of being executed. Okay, and 
the reason they do this is because a given instruction might get slowed up by the speed of light or, or matter or whatever. And if they got something to do faster, they want to not have to wait. They want to be able to do those concurrently. And there's a bunch of other tricks they use. Now, um, you know, they don't make them like they used to. Uh, and this is not all that old. The guy, the bearded guy on the left there, uh, that's, that's like 1980. That's, a, that's an MC68000, which I played with back in the day in the early 80s. Uh, if you look in the 1970s, you end up with something like that. Okay, This is a refrigerator-sized machine. It is not got much memory. It's very slow. The fastest instruction takes 1.6 microseconds to execute. All right, And uh, I'm very proud of the fact of that this is in a museum. They're running a, a, a program. Another guy myself wrote as a, a, in university in 77. Um, I'm very proud of the fact we got trig, sine and cosine, in less than 21 microseconds on a system with 1.6 microsecond uh, minimum instruction latency. OK, but the thing is that uh, this is nice and simple. I mean, if you want to know everything you need to know to program a thing, it was on six sheets of paper. That was it. OK, I don't know if anybody's looked at the Reference manuals for current chips. Uh, the last ones were like uh, that I saw were like uh, what 3,000 pages, something like that. I'm, maybe they're 5,000 by now. I don't know, but they're huge. Okay. On the other hand, this thing was slow. Okay, <laughs> really slow. Now, one question is: We got this old system that isn't that complex by modern standards. The the one that I showed that had all the block diagrams with 100 instructions, sort of waiting and running in parallel. Um, and in some cases, you might need to deal with all that complexity. If you're trying to squeeze the last little bit out of your computer system, and you're willing to throw away your computer system when it starts getting old, um, and if you're willing to rewrite your software with each new rev of silicon, and, 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 right? For the most part, uh, and, and the thing is, these things, some of them, are able to self-repair. They degrade and get old with age, just like I do. And some parts don't work so well, and so in some cases, some CPUs are able to figure that out and turn off that part of the ALU and just not use it. At which point, your carefully optimized software is no longer optimal. So what we do instead is we take a more cartoony view. Uh, we just say, there's a CPU, there's a store buffer that keeps track of things while it's waiting for cache lines to show up, and we have a cache. All right. Um, and if we do it this way, we can get maybe 80 or 90% of the benefit without losing the portability and without quite as much complexity. OK, so what we've got is we're going to look at uh, CPUs, store buffers, cache, and what I'll call the bus. And it used to really be just a series of parallel electrical wires. These days, is some really complicated interconnection network. But too bad, it's still called a bus sometimes. Now, the CPU computes with words, maybe 64 bits. I mean, it depends on the computer. Uh, the store buffer holds words that are waiting for cache lines to show up. And those cache lines are held in a cache, which can be thought of as a hardware hash table. And the lines might be 64 bytes, otherwise known as 512 bits. Or they might be bigger or smaller. It depends on the system. Uh, so what happens is that the system is using this hardware hash table to keep stuff close to the CPU. Okay, So the CPU can have it when it needs it. And this is not a new concept. John von Neumann called out this possibility in 1945, I believe it was. Maybe it was 1947. But in any case, it's been around for a while. Uh, at least the concept has been. And then we have a bus, otherwise also known as interconnect, which communicates these cache lines among the CPUs into memory. So if we take a pictorial view of this, uh, we have CPUs. We're going to let CPU 1 and 2 uh, not do anything because we need space on the chart. And we have a bus that carries cache lines to memory and to the caches so that if a CPU needs something, it can get it from memory or from the cache that has the most recent value, one way or another, and keep, uh, keep things going. And the idea is programs tend to have locality of reference. They tend to use the same thing or use nearby things fairly frequently. And this structure allows the hardware to take advantage of that and work around the speed of light limitations in some cases. In our examples, the data is not going to have any chance to make it to memory, so we'll leave that part out. We'll just have the bus carrying lines around. So let's do some concurrent counting. Who's ready to count? Got a couple people. All right. Um, I guess it's early in the morning. I mean, OK, so let's do it that way, right? Um, so we just count. You know, We add, and we return the counter. We have an unsigned long counter. Um, if we had a signed counter, we'd be have undefined behavior when we wrapped or overflowed. So would anybody care to critique this code? 
I got a couple people nodding yes, but they aren't saying anything. It doesn't scale. Doesn't scale. Okay. Are there any other problems with it? That's true enough. No mutex. Why? Why do you need a mutex? <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, so the problem with this is if you run on a 660 CPUs on a system that doesn't have a memory add instruction that happens to be atomic by luck, uh, you're going to lose 87% of the counts. All right. So you'll count 100 times and end up with like 13 instead of 100, which I mean, there is a role of approximation in computation, don't get me wrong, but this kind of approximation usually isn't what you want, in my experience anyway. So why are the counts lost? Okay, so let's say we've got this. Again, we're going to let CPU 1 and 2 just kind of be spectators, and we're going to have CPU 0 and 3 actually do the work. And what happens, the cache line for the counter is over on CPU 3. So we've got the counter is 0, and that's in CPU 3's cache. CPU 0 is going to try to increment this thing, but it doesn't have the cache line. So what it does is it stores the new value in the store buffer. Okay, And this guy over here, um, this isn't really how it would work. It's more complicated than that, but let's just say that it increments the thing in the cache. All right, So we've got a 1 there. This guy in the meantime says, hey, I don't have a cache line. Give it to me. And that request goes out across the bus. And we count to 2, and we get a 3. And then we say, OK, we'll return 3. At this point, CPU 3 does not have the cache line. And so it's working in the store buffer. So we've got a pair of 4s, which would be a total of 8. And now we come back, and we deposit the 3 into CPU 0's cache. At this point, everybody's, both of them have counted 5 counts for a total of 10. And then they count again, and we have counter equals 6. And the actual total is 12. 6 for each CPU, and there's not a 12 in sight on this diagram. And that's why we're losing counts. And the problem is that the CPU is doing computation all right, but down here in the memory system, we're just overwriting things. And so each time it goes shuttles back and forth, we lose the, the parts that were counted by the other CPUs. And that's exactly why on 6 CPUs, we lose 5 sixths of the count. We get 1 CPU's worth of count. But it goes really fast. So, you know, we get quick write completion. The update is really fast, but um, we, we pay the penalty of losing a lot of counts of horrible inaccuracy. And this is why we have atomic operations, as was alluded to in the back there a little bit ago. So, let's just count atomically. How hard can it be? And if we're in the Linux kernel, we might do something like this. We have an atomic T counter. says that this is a 32-bit atomic counter. And to increment, we do atomic ink, a function we call. And it takes the address of the counter, and, and if we have a whole pile of people trying to increment at the same time, it all sorts it all out, and all the counts get applied. Uh, for the read count, we just do an atomic read of the counter, which picks up the current value. Would somebody like to critique this code? Serialized and slow. Very good. You guys are with it. Yeah, uh, that's what happens on a uh, computer I used to have a while back. It, like, uh, all hardware was mortal and since passed away, but it was really cool. A 440 CPU, 448 CPU, Xeon. And um, uh, if we just have one CPU doing atomic operations, we're getting it done in maybe five nanoseconds. But if we have all of them working at it, we're up above 10 microseconds. All right? So we add CPUs and it gets slower. And not just a little slower, a lot slower. And the reason you heard back there is that we're serializing everything. And this does not make Tux happy. I'm sorry. You know, this, this poor Tux is crying because we did this horrible thing. OK, and, and that was an old system. Let's try a newer one. This is the current machine I happen to have. It's an, a 166 CPU AMD. It's actually a, a guest OS. I don't know if there is an actual hardware that has 166 CPUs, but that's a guest OS. Uh, Milan, and it's a 2 gigahertz. And uh, well, it's not quite as bad. I mean, we're up at 2 microseconds instead of like more than 10. On the other hand, we have a third of the CPUs. We do have tighter integration, so in any case, it's still bad. Okay, I mean, when I add CPUs, I want it to go faster, not slower. I mean, maybe that's just because I'm an old guy that was born in the 1950s, but that's my view of the world. Okay, uh, and you know, uh, Tux is crying, but think of those poor CPUs. You know, they're waiting for this other CPU to do its thing, and then it's taking forever. I mean. Uh, 20 microseconds is a really, really, really long time for a modern CPU to have to wait for all this stuff. You know, why are you putting them through all that trouble? And this is what's happening. 
Uh, this is a diagram. There really are 440 of those little boxes that you see in the, uh, in the eight clumps there. Um, and the cache line is to have to be bat back and forth among all those CPUs. It can only be at one CPU at a time. There's only one copy of it. And it has to travel through all of them. And that takes a long time. Again, finite speed of light, non-zero size of atoms, cache coherence protocols, and everything else. Um, there are some hardware optimization to be applied. Uh, these slides will be available, and you can look at that URL to get more information on that. But uh, no, one question is, should we always avoid atomics? I mean, we don't want to make Tux cry and make the CPUs impatient, right? And as usual, it depends. If you've managed to construct your algorithms so you're over on the left-hand side there, where you just have a few CPUs contending at a particular time, it's not that bad, especially if you aren't doing it that often. But if you're over on the right-hand side, that's a bad idea, and you really need to avoid that. That's a good way to... Uh, 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 if, if it happens in my employer's fleet for whoever's on call to get a, uh, a late night wake up uh, to go fix the problem. So let's not do that. Okay. Uh, sometimes, though, we can do way better. Would somebody like to throw out a thought on how we could do better? It's used pretty heavily. Very good. This guy did it without even looking at the source code. That's pretty good. Um, but, and the other thing that we have to look at there, if we do that, we have stale values. But let's look at the atomic case, all right? Let's suppose we do this. We read the count, and we pass it to a function, pass it to a second function, pass it to a third function, all right? And we've, this thing's atomic, so the count is exact. But how exact is it when we pass it to that third function? Well, to take a look at that, so we've got the value of the counter across time. And if we just plus plus the counter, we end up with that mess down there where we're losing most of the counts, the red line on the bottom. Um, if we're using atomics, we're up there at the top uh, where it's actually giving us all of the counts. It's actually accounting for all the counts. Now, if we have those functions being called at those points in time, so we read once, we passed a one function, a second function, a third function, we're going to use the same value for all three functions despite the fact that it's later. And so we've got a stale value later on. Yeah, we went to all this effort to make sure we had exact atomics, counting everything perfectly, and we still end up with stale values. Okay, and in fact, that count is stale before it even has a chance to be returned from the read function, potentially. So it's not like you can just be fast, because you haven't even got a hold of it before it's stale, maybe. So why would we pay such a high cost for atomics if we aren't getting the value anyway. Say again? Mm -hmm. Okay. So um, let me try to, let me repeat that. Um, the, uh, and yell at me if I don't say what, you're, what you wanted me to say. Um, basically, uh, yeah, we, it gets stale, but we could read it again. And then we get an exact value. And so over time, we'll have something that's, that's reasonable. And that's a nice property from a counter. Uh, so the question is, can we get that property without quite as much expense? Because, yeah, that's important. We want the count to, if we read it this week and read it next week, we'd like to see the fact that there's been a lot of counts in between. And uh, we had the answer earlier. Uh, can we do better if reads are infrequent? Suppose we have a case where reads are infrequent. Can we do better? And we heard earlier that we could use per CPU variables, which are used heavily. And let's look at how that plays out. So we have each CPU has its own variable, counter 0, 1, 2, and 3 there. And then they're in their caches because they're the ones messing with it. And so uh, they increment. They all increment at the same time. That happens fast. We don't have to have kick things kicked out across the commute complex. It's just right there. And again, and again, and again. And then if the third CPU wants to add them up, it has to ask for those counters. It's going to get them. They're marked shared in the other one so that we know we don't get them out of sync. And we'll work, I'm not going to dig into that very far, but uh, then it can add them up, and we get an actual count of 15, which is actually the count, as opposed to one-fourth of the count. All right. So um, here, if we do this, the updates are really, really fast. I mean, that thing stays in our cache. We increment it. It's, uh, uh, it's great. But the reads are kind of slow. We're having to sum all this stuff up. And if you have, oh, I used to have a machine with 448 CPUs. 
I got a bug report in 2012 from a machine with 4,096 CPUs, and that's going to take some time to add all those things up. On the other hand, uh, the error is limited by the change in that, you know, kind of platonic counter during the summation. So we'll start summing it here, we'll finish here, and uh, the counter has kind of a conceptual value, and we'll get something in between that. So we've got, you know, reasonable errors. We've got a real value of the counter somewhere in the middle. And uh, that's the, uh, now, now on the bottom, those little x's right on the x-axis, right there at like a, a few nanoseconds, actually it's a fraction of a nanosecond, that's what we're getting for the update. So if reads are infrequent, this is wonderful. You know, we've made Tux happy. But if we're having, if, so if the updates are frequent, we're great, if the reads are infrequent. But if we're doing a lot of reads, we're still back in trouble here. Now, um, here's the pseudocode we used. And so we just added one to the counter using write once to avoid compiler mischief. And uh, we went through and read each one and added them up and started the sum equals zero. And that's the kind of code there. And so that's kind of what we're starting with. And the question is, can we do better on the update side? Can we, can we, can we have our cake and eat it too? Can we have our update side cake and, and eat our read, read side cake as well? And have it be fast on both ends. Any thoughts on how to do that? Flipping, uh, there's a catch box there oh. for you. So sp split things in groups? Split it in groups. Um, uh, uh, yeah, I'm not sure how that's actually going to work with pure CPU variables, so thinking about it. You, you could do something like that. <laughs> um, there, there is, a, but uh, I'm going to try some, I'd like something simpler. All right, last mail. Batching, uh, like uh, counting on the pure CPU counter when it goes over a threshold, okay. uh, one atomic operation. Okay, so what we could do is we could kind of cache value, sort of like a slab al allocator that Blastville might know something about. And then uh, once the per CPU has got above a certain point, we take and dump that into the global. So then we just use the global as, a, as an estimate. Okay, and uh, I'm gonna do something kind of like that, but I'm gonna make it even more, uh, even simpler, because this is just a presentation rather than actual Linux kernel code. What you said might work better for actual Linux kernel code. Uh, what we're going to do um, is, is to get around this is we're going to add these functions to what we saw on the previous slide. So we're going to have another variable, countersum, and then uh, to read, we're just going to read that variable. That's all we do. When somebody says uh, read count fast, we just give them that variable. You can still count, say uh, read count if you want to do it slowly and get something fresher perhaps. And we're going to have a thread that goes through. You could do a bunch of other ways of doing this, but you could have a thread that goes through and just occasionally sums up the counters and sticks it in that counter sum. And here we're waiting 10 milliseconds, 10 jiffies, 10 milliseconds on most systems, uh, between each time we do that. And that means is that you can very quickly read that thing and uh, you'll be out of date by maybe 10 milliseconds. If you're reading it every minute or so, who cares about 10 milliseconds? But sometimes you do care. And if we do this, um, we make hap tux happy on both ends. This graph looks ugly at the far end, but it goes only up to six nanoseconds, okay? As opposed to the previous ones, which are going up into the microseconds or even tens of microseconds. Um, we do see some uh, degradation at the high end uh, and uh, uh, thermal throttling, uh, and on some systems, uh, uh, hyperthreading can make that happen. But uh, it's a lot better than we had before. So. Um, all the operations are a few nanoseconds, why not you just do this all the time, right? And of course, it's like anything else, this is engineering, not science, there are downsides, okay? We don't get to ignore things. And here's a bunch of reasons. I mean, you have this extra thread, and sometimes you can't afford that. Um, the thread is going to be waking up every 10 milliseconds. That, if you do that, and you have it in the core kernel, you will get, the uh, last time I did that, I got a really nasty phone call. They, they weren't satisfied with flaming on the Linux kernel mail list, they called me on the phone and yelled at me. Uh, so if you do that, the battery power guys are going to be very angry with you. Um, and uh, the thing is, the counter reads are normally infrequent for statistical things. You do the statistics on every packet reception, and you uh, read them out every time you, you know, every few seconds or every few minutes. So why bother? All right. And yeah, that might take 160 uh, micro, uh, excuse me, 160 microseconds to do the read. But if you're not doing that very often, who cares? Okay, and there's some other things. Um, let's see. The first two um, are what Philostomil was suggesting, um, and, the, and I have a book that has these in it. The URLs have been in there, and I'm not going to, I've only got so much time, so I'm not going to go through them. What I'm going to do instead 
is uh, take a look at, very quickly at some case studies of counting in the Linux kernel. And I'm just going to, this is just overview. Please don't expect that you'll take this slide and turn it into production quality code. Um, actually, if you want to do that, look at the code itself, all right? Because I'm doing a high level overview here. So statistical counters are the first one, and this is used all over the place. Um, this CPU ink is the workhorse there, and there's more than 300 uses of it. And sometimes what they do, for example, for networks, they do this CPU ink to count the packets, and this CPU add to count the bytes. All right, the CPU add takes a, a number or whatever. It's normally open coded. There aren't abstractions for it, and I'm, it's not clear to me that there should be. Maybe there should be, but whatever. And I have a textbook that was published in 1987. This says, as an aside, as if it was obvious and everybody knew it, um, this is how you do statistics. So this has been known for a very long time. I don't know who invented it. And it may have been invented in the 60s or maybe even the 50s, for all I know. Okay, so per CPU rough counts, uh, this is going to be a very cartoony view of it. Um, the idea is this is a reference count that is very, very fast, but when you need to tell if it's zero, it squishes it down into a single variable. Let's, let's look at the cartoon. So normally we have per CPU counters, and then there's a function you can call that just squishes this down into a single counter, at which point we get very slow for a while, but we can immediately tell when it goes to zero. The problem with the per CPU counts is that you add them up, but you have skew, so you don't know what the value is really. And then you can um, also switch back, although in many cases what people do is they turn it to global when they want to tear it down, and then when it goes to zero they get rid of it and call it good. Um, this is very cartoony. There's a lot of weird things that go wrong, race conditions and everything. Uh, don't try to code it from this diagram. Look at the code in the kernel. All right, it's, there's a lot, of, uh, a lot of hair on this one. But that's kind of the conceptually what's happening. Now, what's happening, what we're doing here, is we're going for per CPU to global to do full synchronization. And so one question is, can we do anything with synchronization while leaving it per CPU? And how will we do that? And Matthew, you already know, so no fair answering. What we can do is what SRCU does. And again, this is going to be very cartoony. What happens is we have per CPU counters, we have four of them. We, in the, we, in, in the left-hand side of each CPU, we have the number of locks. On the right side for each CPU, we have the number of unlocks. But we have two variables for each as an array. And we have an indication of which the current side of that array is. So right now, the current one is the zero indexed one. So if we do an SRCU read lock from CPU zero, it's going to increment that one in the upper uh, left-hand corner of CPU zero's counter. So you can see it's one now instead of zero. But the current has also been updated. We're going to do a grace period, so we update that. And then what that means, if we have another SRCU read lock, say on CPU one, it's going to increment the bottom one. And meanwhile, uh, the SRC read lock from CPU 0 may have gone to sleep and woken up on CPU 2. When it does this unlock, it's going to do 0, but on the other CPU. And once that's done, the num if you add up the locks and then add up the unlocks, they're equal. And that means that all of the old readers are gone. All right? Because the new readers are doing the other side. And so there's, there are tricks you can use. Again, there's a lot of hair on this that I'm not showing here. But that's kind of the overall concept of one of the things you can do. Uh, and again, please study the SRCU code before you try to, uh, don't try to do it just from these slides. Okay, uh, so the cool thing about counting is it's uh, simple. Oh, go ahead. Uh, for the previous slide, the current index, is it global or it's per CPU? Uh, the current index is global. So, we, so everybody looks at that global thing and uses that to choose which side of, the, uh, of their array they're going to use. And so it's read and written with atomic operations, right? Um, it actually, it's just, uh, it, it uses read once and write once, but it's just straight load and store instructions at the machine level. OK, no, so it doesn't no. have to be like exactly synchronized across all CPUs? Uh, that's part of the hair. It, <laughs> you have to handle the fact that it isn't. And okay. that's one of the reasons why you shouldn't try to code SRCU from this diagram. OK, I won't. Thank you. <laughs> I'm well, happy to take you through it sometime if you'd like, but probably not this morning. Okay, so yeah, good question. Um, so the key point, why mess with counting? Well, the thing is, everybody knows counting, or thinks they do, and it's actually pretty simple. So we don't have all these complexities of weird uh, 
linked data structures that are being atomically updated with, updated with compare exchange. It's, it's a fairly simple operation, but it shows us how partitioning, it shows us that partial partitioning helps, it shows us that delay can help, as we saw with the one where we aggregated the stuff in the single counter to get fast reads. Uh, however, this is engineering, not science. I mean, there's occasional science going on, but it's mostly engineering, and that's about trade-offs. And that means that the hardware and the workload affect the optimal design. Okay, and sometimes you have to pick a design that's not optimal for any one workload, but does fairly well for everybody. So it's, uh, I have a lot of fun with it. Some people get frustrated. That's life. Okay, partie de computage. Have you guys learned anything? So we, um, we had a couple of people handing out the candies, and what I need you to do is count them. Um, and you need to figure out how you're doing that. Uh, perhaps each row does a sum and they sum them up. You're free to use smartphones or whatever else you want to help with arithmetic in case you were, are young enough that you weren't taught mental arithmetic in school. So we'll give you a few minutes here to go through this. We're going to give you another minute. One more minute. I see some people are taking a very practical uh, view of this thing, uh, and uh, that's sometimes, uh, sometimes being pragmatic is uh, the win. <laughs> All right, things are quieting down, so have we got a number? I'm hearing a lot of silence. Well, this was kind of an unfair question. Um, I used to work at a grocery store when, in, when I was in high school. And uh, this is back when inventories were manual. So you had a bunch of people running in the grocery store physically counting everything and, and recording it. And it was, uh, so I got a uh, early introduction to how hard counting can be, okay? All you have to do is get somebody confused, two people count something twice, so, you know, it gets, or they forget something, it gets messy really quickly. Um, but on the other hand, uh, you could argue that wasn't a fair question. Uh, but, you know, if you're only capable of answering fair questions. There's gonna be a lot of very important questions you're gonna to fail to answer, all right? So, you know, take as it is. Anyway, uh, this is why we have computers do our accounting for us, all right? <laughs> okay, so in summary, uh, modern hardware is highly optimized, but it, it's optimized for given things. The incremental improvements are doing integration. Um, and, uh, the key thing is you want to use existing software. So if your Linux kernel uses stuff that's already there, and also uh, structure your code and data to avoid the big obstacles. And there's a lot of tricks for fast concurrent counting, depending on what you're doing. More information here. And this is my uh, recipe from last year. And on this one, um, if you prefer English units, uh, on this one, I got a lot of uh, odd questions and I gave answers that were perhaps even more odd. But as near as I can tell, the, what people were really getting at was uh, uh, what constitutes an overdose. Uh, you know, if, if, you, if you take this vodka and blackberry concoction, how much of it is too much? And so this year's recipe answers that question. Okay, and uh, here's the uh, version of it there. Um, again, for those that uh, prefer English units, So basically, you stuff with popcorn and you cook it for five hours or until something exciting happens. Now, this recipe, you don't, you don't get the use out of this recipe by actually following it. It works, it's kind of like a meta recipe, kind of like RCU in that way. If you're looking at this recipe and it seems like a good idea, you have well and truly overdosed. 
And as always, use the right tool for the job. If there is no right tool, invent one. And uh, if we have maybe a minute or two for questions at this point, I think. Thank you. If we don't have questions, um, thank you very much for your time and attention. Hopefully this is of use to you. And uh, uh, thanks again to Anne for providing the props, which I see some of you are enjoying already. Uh, and uh, on to the next talk. Cheers.